All right, everybody, good evening. Welcome to our presentation on Pulp Fiction. Uh, and just as a means of explanation, this is really meant to be kind of a general overview of, of the Pope, the papacy, as, as it were. This is not meant to be a referendum on Pope Francis or anything like that. Uh, so if you're here with, you know, if you're gunning for Pope Francis tonight, you're in the wrong venue, I'm afraid. There's really not much I can say about that. I will say, though, I have a presentation prepared, but at the end of the presentation, I hope to have plenty of time. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask, I'll try to, try to answer them. Um, one thing that I want to point out is that this presentation is inspired by, but is not necessarily uh, strictly slavish to this book by Patrick Madrid called Pope Fiction. It's a very good book, but it goes into such great depth that I couldn't possibly do it justice here tonight. But I highly recommend Pope Fiction to your reading uh, library. Uh, it's got a, really, a lot of really good stuff. It answers a lot of questions that people have about the Pope and the papacy and things like that. And there are some things I'll touch on that come from Pope, uh, from Pope Fiction, but not exclusively. Um, most of you know that Patrick Madrid, the author of that book, is also the morning host, uh, uh, one of the morning hosts on Relevant Radio. He's a very good uh, Catholic speaker and what's called an apologist. An apologist, of course, is not somebody who apologizes for being Catholic, but rather it's from based on the ancient term apologia, which means to explain, to teach, basically. So Catholic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Patrick Madrid actually is one of the original members of a group, a radio show called Catholic Answers. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that, but that's based out of San Diego. Their website is catholic.com. Uh, but they have a radio show every day. It's two hours, I believe. I think it's on the EWTN network. And it was really influential in my coming into the church, my understanding the faith better. So when I first came into the Catholic faith in the year 2000, I had done a lot of study, but that I somehow stumbled upon that Catholic Answers program, and that was really pivotal for me. So I'm always grateful to Patrick Madrid and all the others over there at Catholic Answers. So what I want to do tonight is... Um, I want to take a little bit of a different approach. I don't want to just have a flat-out lecture, as it were. And, you know, I, most of us have not been in school for a while, so I thought it would be important for us to kind of get our adrenaline going, to get a little bit nervous, to try to bring back some of those, those icky feelings we had from school when we weren't prepared, maybe, for a quiz. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of do this presentation as, as sort of a quiz. What I'll do is I'll show a slide. It'll ask a question. It'll have some options. And I'll give you a couple of moments to kind of take a look at the options, and then I'll show you the answer and maybe uh, explain a little bit more uh, about the answer. That's kind of the format that I'm looking at doing tonight. So, um, yeah, so, uh, and again, when I'm finished, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. So if you can hold off on your questions till the end, I, I would appreciate it. Okay, so, whoops, that didn't do it. There we go. Okay, so our first question of the night is, what does the word Pope mean? Is it King, Father, Lord, or Pontiff? So I'll give you a couple of moments to think about that. What does the word Pope mean? King, Father, Lord, or Pontiff? All right, so let's go ahead and get the answer here. So the answer, of course, is Father, Father. The word Pope derives from the Italian word Papi, uh, or Papa, which means father. And also in the Greek, it's Papas, which basically means the, the same thing. It appears that um, unofficially, at least, this term Pope was first used by St. Leo the Great back in the fifth century. So it wasn't something that originated right away. It took a few hundred years before the church started to adopt this term to describe the leader of the Catholic Church. The first official use of the word Pope was by Pope Gregory VII in the 11th century. So it's something that's been around for a long time, obviously, but it actually didn't emerge right away as the faith, as the faith did. Um, and of course, you know, the, the reason why Father is so important is, is that as the successor to St. Peter, the Pope's role is really to be sort of fatherly figure to the people of God. Um, much like a father passes on knowledge to his children, so the Pope, the father of, uh, of us, so to speak, our, our Holy Father, his job is to pass along to us important knowledge, divine knowledge, if you will. And also, very much like a father in a family, uh, the, the Pope's authority is supreme. 
just like a father's authority is supreme within the family. Uh, but it's meant to be that that authority is meant to be exercised in a paternal way, not a, necessarily a, an authoritative way or, or a, or a, or a uh, um, dictatorial way, but in a way that helps to teach but also makes clear that this is the firm answer, the firm response. Um, just a, a real quick thing on that letter D, pontiff, the option of pontiff. This is one of the titles for the Pope, so you'll often see the word pontiff. That comes from the word Latin for pontifex, which uh, basically means high priest. And what it re really means is, uh, the term that's often used is bridge maker. Uh, so in pre-Christian times, if someone was a high priest in Rome, they were given this name of bridge builder because uh, they were trying to bridge the gods. Remember, they, the, were, the Romans worshipped pagan gods. So these high priests were trying to bridge the gap between the gods and men. Um, and so as time wore on and Christianity started to take hold, this idea of bridge builder took on a whole different whole different meaning and was sort of more or less co-opted by the Catholic Church, which, uh, which is not unusual actually in our faith. Okay, so that's number one. The next question is, what is the minimum requirement to become a pope? So you have to either A, be a baptized male who is a practicing Catholic, or do you have to be a member of the College of Cardinals, or do you have to be a bishop from one of the three largest dioceses in his particular country? So I'll give you a couple of moments to think about that. So the answer is A, believe it or not. The only requirement to be a pope is to be a baptized male Catholic. That's it. So in theory, there are several men in this room who could be pope, but <laughs> John perhaps, yes. Uh, but the, the reality is it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and no offense, John. I mean, you're a great guy. I, I love you. You know, uh, yeah, John's a great guy. And uh, but uh, no, anymore. The reality is, you really need to be a cardinal to be elevated to the status of pope. Um, it's been really about 700 years since there's been someone elected pope outside of the College of Cardinals. So the reality is, if you want to be pope, if it's something that's a burning desire for you, John, you'll need to you know take a different route than you. And you probably have to ditch your family. Uh, that's going to be an important thing. So uh, that could cause problems of its own. So. Um, the, uh, the last pope who was actually chosen outside of the College of Cardinals was Pope Urban in the year 1378. I don't think any of us were around back then. Um, and so uh, also let's always keep in mind that the pope is actually considered as well the bishop of Rome, right? So he is a bishop. And again, the reality is most, most popes have been cardinals before they're elevated or elected uh, to the papacy. All right. Our next question, this should be easy. Which of the original 12 apostles is considered to be the first pope? A, Paul, B, John, C, Peter, or D, Andrew? So I won't think we need a lot of time on that because the answer is, of course, C, Peter. Now, um, I think it's really important to remember that if you take a look at the New Testament, Peter is by far the apostle who is mentioned the most which is a significant thing because that gives you a sense of his status. So whenever people maybe question whether Peter truly should be considered to have been the first pope, it's pretty undeniable, at least based on biblical evidence, that the early church saw Peter as the leader. In fact, he appears 195 times under various names in the New Testament. Um, the next most often apostle is actually just St. John. He's only mentioned 29 times. So you can see the disparity between the mentions. And again, that gives you a sense of how important Peter was. And of course, if you've been following the readings this week at Mass, you know that in the accounts of the resurrection account, um, there's the, the story of how John and Peter both ran to the tomb. And John actually got there first, but he did not go into the tomb, but rather he waited for Peter to arrive, which is, gives you a sense of the importance and the deference that, the, that they had to Peter. So even though John got there first, he waited for Peter and gave Peter the, uh, the ability or the, the uh, preference to go in. Um, also, if you notice, whenever there's a listing of the apostles in, uh, in the New Testament, Peter's always mentioned first, and ironically, Judas Iscariot is always mentioned last, as he should be, right? As he should be. 
Okay, so I just want to kind of uh, uh, expand a little bit on this notion about Peter and him being chosen to lead the church. As Catholics, I think it's very important that we have a firm understanding of, of why it is that Peter was chosen and also the, the evidence that we can show people who maybe are skeptical about this. So for us as Catholics, when we look at the Bible, the most significant but not the only piece of evidence, but the most significant is the Gospel of Matthew, and in particular, chapter 16. And in chapter 16, this is where, you know, Jesus asks the apostles, who do people say that I am? And of course, there's a variety of answers that are, that are offered, but Peter is the only one to say, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. He is the only one who correctly identifies who Jesus was. Even though it's clear that Peter didn't have a full understanding of what that meant, but he at least had a much better insight than anybody else in order to be able to answer that question. So that's very important to keep in mind. Also, within uh, Matthew chapter 16, we have the famous uh, time in which Jesus is talking to the apostles and he points to Peter and he says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Netherworld or Hades, depending on what version of the Bible you have, will not prevail against it. And then also what's very important in this, in this uh, section is that he talks about, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, this is often um, sort of taken as just the rationale behind the idea of confession, but it's actually much deeper than that. It's much deeper than that. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in, in just a moment. One of the things that you want to keep in mind is, is that in the ancient world, keys were really important. Um, you know, keys provided access to the most important uh, parts of, of the community, if you will. And of course, their, their basic purpose is to open and close doors. So to talk about keys back then especially was a, a very important thing. A lot of people wouldn't have had keys necessarily for their homes, only the, only the most powerful did. So his, his authority, Peter's authority, has some unique and, and very universal qualities, and we'll talk about a little bit more here. Now, I wanted to uh, point out something that maybe isn't well known, but when Jesus talks about Jesus and he anoints him, or talks about him being the rock, this discussion takes place in, an, in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And this was... Um, Originally, this was a town, its original name was Panias, and it was named after the, the Roman god Pan, P-A-N. Um, but it, the name was changed by Philip Herod, who was the tetrarch, or sort of the, uh, kind of the, the, re, the governor of that region, if you will, and he changed it and renamed it Caesarea Philippi, which basically means Caesar's city from Philip. So it was kind of a gift to Caesar from Philip, if you will. Now, Caesarea Philippi is, is located in northeastern uh, Israel, and, and it's in the foothills of a mountain range, and it's actually right along the border where Lebanon and Syria and Israel meet. So what's really important here is, is you take a look at the picture, and I know it's not the most clear picture, but you can see that there's a huge rock formation that, you, uh, that is on the screen here. And kind of in the middle of the picture, you can see a dark spot. That's actually a huge cave. So when we think about this time when Jesus is talking to Peter and talking about him being the rock, we tend to imagine, we think that this was probably the place where it, where it happened. And, be, and so there's a significance to the idea of rock. It wasn't just like they were on a, on a beach. They were literally by this huge rock. And so Jesus was using this to, to point out the significance of what he was saying. So the, the cave area that you see here, that was often known by the locals as the gates of Sheol or the gates of hell, okay? So again, are the gates of the underworld. So when Jesus says the gates of the underworld or netherworld will not prevail against it, that's what he's kind of talking about. So you can imagine Jesus basically standing in this area with Peter and the other apostles having this discussion. Uh, by the way, the water that you see here at the bottom of the screen, that's actually um, one of the three sources of the Jordan River right there. Now, I want to show you another uh, perspective on Caesarea Philippi that maybe can help a little bit too. So in the, in the back area, you can see that large white cliff where it says Grotto of Pan. So you can imagine Jesus is having this, this discussion right outside of a temple in which a pagan god is being worshipped. And this is pretty typical for Jesus, right? Jesus 
he, he kind of had, uh, well, how can we say it? Uh, he, he, he liked to kind of have one-upsmanship, I guess you could say. And so you can imagine him standing outside of that, that grotto for a, a, a pagan god and talking about all this. But it gives you a sense of the perspective of the place. So you can see the huge cliff that that, that was uh, located on. So um, in biblical translations, uh, if when the when the Bible, at least the New Testament, when it was first written, all the different books, the Greek was the main language, of course, uh, for those. And so, in Greek, we hear the word Petros. That's that's basically means rock, and that's where the name Peter derives from. Um, and the language that Jesus would have actually spoken, though, rather than Greek, was Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the language that, uh, or the name that he gave Simon was Kephas or Cephas, um, and that means rock, so K-E-P-H-A-S. And you'll see this sometimes in, in New Testament as well. So it's important because sometimes there are people who dispute the, the uh, significance of Peter, and specifically they'll dispute whether Peter actually is the person that Jesus designated to be the leader of the church. And um, it's, it's important to know this stuff, especially the sort of the backdrop in which this discussion took place because it just sort of fortifies everything that Jesus was saying talking about rock. He wasn't just pulling something out of thin air. He was using his surroundings as he so often did to make a point. Now, another thing that a lot of people don't uh, know necessarily um, is when Jesus is talking about giving Peter the keys to the kingdom and binding and loosing, this actually is a reference back to the Old Testament. And so in the book of Isaiah, uh, this, this is actually talked about as well. In the ancient world, prior, you know, in the times even prior to Jesus, the way that you had a king, a king would have a number two person. That person was called the royal steward. And so the king had control over a particular territory. The steward basically was in charge of the palace and was kind of what you might today consider the, uh, the equivalent of like the chief of staff to the president of the United States, right? So he took care of a whole lot of other stuff related to administrative affairs. And so in the ancient world, the royal steward would be the one who was entrusted with the keys to the palace. So he was the one that would basically decide who could come in to see the king and who could not. Um, and also, another thing that was very important was this idea of binding and loosing. What that means is, is that in the Old Testament, when they talked about binding and loosing, this meant that a person who had that authority, that is, they had the authority to interpret divine law. Okay? So they had the authority to basically determine, to, to explain to people what God meant or what certain things meant that were deemed to have come from God. And so when we see Jesus talking to Peter and talking about keys and binding and loosing, he's all pulling this out of Isaiah, ironically enough. And also, in a sense of irony, Isaiah chapter 22 is also where we have the famous scene where Jesus is on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, actually, if you read on, that's also from Isaiah 22. And that, that also, though, um, that also uh, is misunderstood because people think that think that Jesus was abandoned. No, he actually, if you read on, it's actually a very hopeful thing. He, he feels maybe initially abandoned, but he also knows that there's great hope about what's to come. So, you know, if you really are interested, uh, take a look at the book of Isaiah. There's a lot of parallels between Isaiah and especially in the, in the New Testament readings, especially in the Gospels. So that might be an interesting thing to do sort of if you're looking for something to do in your free time. When, if you're thinking, okay, I want to I read scripture, what should I do? Maybe take a look at Isaiah and see how that kind of compares and how many things you see in Isaiah that actually pop up again in the New Testament because that's really important. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, uh, before I move on, I do want to say that um, there's a book, it's a real short book. Anyway, I don't know if we have it in our parish library or not, but it's called Stunned by Scripture. It's by John Bergsma, who is a well-known biblical scholar who is a professor at uh, Franciscan University in Steubenville. And he wrote a, a book called Stunned by Scripture, which is basically his spiritual autobiography, I guess you could say. So John Bergsma grew up in a Calvinist household. He became a Calvinist preacher, but he ultimately... Uh, after years of being a pastor, he realized that he had to become Catholic because all the, everything he was seeing in the Bible 
was only making sense through the Catholic lens, if you will. And so in this book, Stunned by Scripture, uh, Bergsma does a really great job of taking that passage of Isaiah 22 and really kind of fleshing it out. So I, I highly recommend this book to you for not only that chapter where he talks about the, the similarities between Matthew 16 and Isaiah 22, but also just his story is just fascinating. And he writes in a style that's very readable, very accessible, very easy to read. So uh, maybe look it up on our parish library and see if we have this, first of all. Uh, if not, it's, it's, real, it's a real quick read and it's not very expensive. So I highly recommend anything by Bergsma especially stunned by scripture. Okay, so another thing that we want to remember is, is that another piece of evidence that we have that Jesus wanted Peter to lead his church was the fact that Jesus specifically told him that he was praying for him, right? That his faith would not fail. Knowing all the things that were about to transpire and how he would, he would uh, betray Jesus, uh, still, Jesus, in particular, talked about how he was praying for him. We don't see him, we don't see Jesus talking about praying for other apostles in particular. But with, but with Simon, Simon Peter, we do see that. So that's very important. And the idea here is that in order to, you know, a, a pope's purpose is to unite the church, the people. And he wants to avoid division. And so it's very important to to know that the devil, of course, his intent is to divide as, as much as he can and as many as he can. And so Jesus, in his prayer to Peter, is trying to get him to hold fast so that he can have that sense of, of staying strong when people are opposing him. And uh, so um, what we're seeing here is, is that Jesus is preparing Peter to say, look, you're going to be taking over, essentially. You're going to become the royal steward. I'm giving you the keys. You're going to be the one that has in charge of the palace. I'm the king still, but you're essentially the number two man. And so he's, he's trying to affirm him and kind of get him, get him ready with that. And then uh, I just want to show this, pope from, uh, this, pope, this quote from Monsignor Charles Pope who is a, a native of Chicago, uh, although he's been out in Washington, D.C. now for many years. And some of you may be familiar with his writings. He's a columnist for Our Sunday Visitor. He's written for some other publications. He also has a, just a blog that he's written for years with the Archdiocese of Washington. Anyway, um, you know, I think Monsignor Pope really puts it well in that it's really important, the idea of the Pope, because you've got to have this unifying figure within the church. Otherwise, you've got this this classic disunity in which really any, anybody's opinion goes, right? And so one of the things that Christ in, in establishing Peter as the head of the church was to create this figure, this, this individual, this office that would be able to have authority and be a definitive figure so that when questions arose, they could come to that source as opposed to everybody just relying on their own, their own opinions. And of course, for those of you maybe that have come from a Protestant background, you know that um, within the Protestant tradition, it's very easy to see churches split up and be kind of split up, splinter off into other uh, churches because of disagreements with the, uh, the leadership, right? And even in Bergsma's book, he talks about how he and another gentleman who were sort of sharing the pastorate of an inner city parish in Detroit when they were in the Calvinist church, they had some disagreements and they ended up uh, you know, having to split off because of it. So uh, the, the whole point of, the, one of the points of the, of the Pope is to be this unifying figure that, that, the, that the church really needs. Uh, because I think it's fair to say, if you've been Catholic long enough, I mean, even we Catholics, we have a Pope, but a lot of us have various opinions about things, right? And if we just left it up to our own devices, the church might operate a lot differently, I suppose, for better or for worse. But, you know, considering all of us in this room probably have different opinions about X, Y, or Z, you can see how, what the chaos that would, can, uh, would, would follow from that. So, you know, again, we want to have one, one person, one source that can answer our questions. Okay, so I'm going to move on now. Uh, we've got a few questions now that are a little bit more lighthearted, I guess you could say. So which country has produced the most popes? Is it A, France, B, Germany, C, Greece, D, Italy, or E, Syria? Okay. So the answer for this one is Italy, by a long ways. <laughs> it's not even close. Um, there have been 266 popes, and 217 of them have come from Italy. 
Uh, now, the, the five nations that are listed here are actually the f top five pope producers, <laughs> if I could say that, I guess. Uh, there's never been a pope from the United States. Maybe one day there will be, who knows. Um, our current pope, Pope Francis, is from Argentina. And so he's the only pope that has come from not only that country, but from any of the Americas uh, thus far. Um, he's also the only pope who is a member of the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus, whose founder is St. Ignatius. Um, now, the last Italian pope was actually Pope John Paul I, and some of you were alive when he was a pope. Uh, you may not remember much because he was only pope for 33 days. Uh, he was found in bed one morning. He apparently had been reading. He had reading materials spread out on the bed. Um, and his reading light was still on, so the speculation is, is that he died of a heart attack, although nobody, there's not been a definitive answer as to what killed him. But um, John Paul I was declared venerable by his successor, John Paul II, who I think most of us are aware of, in the year 2003. So being declared venerable is the first step toward being named a saint in the Catholic Church. All right. Uh, speaking of John Paul II, just a few uh, things here. John Paul II was extraordinary in many ways and uh, a very historic figure in many ways. And three of the big reasons why is, first of all, when he was elected at the age of 58, he was the youngest pope in almost 150 years, first of all. He's the only pope who's ever come from Poland, and he's actually the only pope that's come from a communist country. And then he was the first non-Italian pope elected to the, uh, the office in 455 years. So when he was uh, named Pope in 1978, it was an extraordinary moment. And I'm sure some of you remember that. I was not Catholic at the time. I was only 13, so I wouldn't have <laughs> remembered much anyway. Uh, but, but I think that as time goes by, people will look back on the pontificate, that is, the years in which John Paul II was Pope. And I think his, his um, the respect and admiration will only grow over time for him. He was not a perfect pope, but he, he, was, he was quite good, quite good. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Another question is, how long can a pope serve, right? So is it 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, or does he serve until he dies or resigns? Okay, so this should be a layup for everybody. Uh, the answer is E, of course. Um, almost every pope who's ever served has served until he died. Um, in fact, here's kind of a fun, twisted fact, I guess you could say. The first 32 popes were martyrs. They were all killed. They were all murdered for being, for being Christian. Um, so imagine, just to kind of put that in perspective, if the first 32 U.S. presidents had been assassinated, that means everybody from George Washington all the way through Franklin Delano Roosevelt would have been, would have been murdered. Can you imagine the impact that would have had on our country if that was the, what had happened? I mean, I'm, this would be a completely different country, I'm sure, if that had been the case. Um, now, occasionally, we all know that a pope does resign. And so we have Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, who resigned in 2013 uh, and was replaced by Pope Francis. Now, Benedict was the first pope to voluntarily resign in more than 700 years. So it's a very rare thing for a pope to resign. So the last pope who resigned before Benedict was Gregory XII in the year 1415. Um, the very first pope to resign was uh, Celestine V in 1294. He was an interesting story. He was an 84-year-old hermit when he was elected, and it took him about a month to realize that he wasn't up to the job. He couldn't handle all the responsibilities that, uh, that were necessary for him to, to lead the church. And so he actually resigned after just five months in office. It was just too much for him. So, um, you know, I do think, though, that we, one thing we should be prepared for is, is that um, as, as human beings generally live longer, and modern medicine continues to enable us to live longer, we should probably be prepared to see popes living longer as well. Uh, currently, uh, Francis, I think, is 85. Pope Francis is 85. And, you know, it's hard to say, um, you know, how much, how much longer he'll, he will go. But, um, you know, uh, John Paul II made it to, to his 80s. Benedict, of course, was in his 80s when he resigned. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see more popes living longer than maybe we've seen before in the church's history, which just makes sense. I mean, people are living longer generally. Okay, the next question is, what's the youngest age at which a pope was ever elected? So was it uh, 20, 33, 41, 52, or 60? What would be the youngest age that somebody was elected pope? 
20, 33, 41, 52, or 60? Amazingly, I think, the answer is A, 20. Um, there have been two popes who were elected at the age of 20. Now, both of them, this was about a thousand years ago, so it's been quite a while. And my guess would be we're probably never in our lifetime, and maybe never even again, we'll see a pope elected that young. So John the 11th and Benedict the 9th, uh, back about, like I said, more than a thousand years ago. So the youngest pope in recent times was John Paul II, who was 58 when he was elected in 1978. So he was the youngest pope in more than 120 years. So uh, yeah, I thought that was really, uh, really surprising. So we'll flip that question now and say, okay, well, what's the oldest age at which a pope has been elected? 75, 79, 84, or 88? Okay, so our answer on that is 79. So that would be uh, a couple of popes in the 17th century, Clement X and Alexander VIII. Now, the two most recent popes, Francis and Benedict, are among the two oldest popes ever elected. So uh, Francis was 76 when he was elected in 2013, and now he's 85 years old. And Benedict XVI was 78 when he was elected in 2005. Uh, he retired in 2013, obviously, and he just turned 95 last week, by the way. So uh, continue to pray for, for both popes, actually. <coughs> so that's interesting. All right. So let's talk about how does a pope get elected, okay? Uh, are they A, selected by the Roman Curia? B, uh, is it based on their score on the Christos Intelligente exam? Or C, are they chosen by the College of Cardinals uh, while they're meeting in Rome, okay? This should not be too much of a challenge, and as you probably guessed, the answer is C, chosen by the College of Cardinals. So when a pope dies or resigns, First of all, what happens is there's traditionally a nine-day period of mourning, okay? Um, and so nothing takes place basically while there's behind-the-scenes stuff, of course, preparing for, say, a funeral and the upcoming election. But otherwise, things are quiet for nine days to allow for mourning to take place. So immediately after this nine-day period, the College of Cardinals will meet in an electoral session. It's called a conclave. And the first conclave actually took place in the year 1274. So this is something that the church has been doing for a long time. Now, during a conclave, the cardinals are locked in the Sistine Chapel. I don't know if you know what the Sistine Chapel is, is within St. Peter's Cathedral. Has anybody been to the Sistine Chapel? Okay, good. Um, so they're basically not allowed to leave except for meals, bathroom breaks, and sleep uh, until they pick a pope. Um, and actually, things are better now than they used to be. They weren't even uh, allowed to um, eat until they picked a pope hundreds of years ago. So um, they, they really got them to hurry up. <laughs> um, so whenever the College of Cardinals gathers in a conclave to vote on a pope, the, uh, at least two-thirds of the ballots that are cast, plus one, have to name the same person. Okay. Um, if nobody's elected in three days, then what happens is there's a required day off for prayer. So all the cardinals just spend a day of prayer asking the Holy Spirit to help guide them in their, uh, in their deliberations. Um, and also they can talk amongst themselves on that day as well. Um, so when the College of Cardinals does deliberate, they'll often take more than one vote. They don't just usually just do one vote. Usually it's a few. And every time, and some of you have probably seen this, the, the pictures or video of this, every time the ballots are burned, okay? And they add special substances to the burning ballots so that the smoke either comes out black, which means they haven't picked a pope yet, or white, which means we have a pope, okay? So that's, that explains why the white and the black pope. So when a pope is chosen, uh, the phrase is habemos papam, we, we have a pope. Um, so what happens immediately after a pope is chosen is that they're asked what, uh, well, first of all, they're asked, do you accept this? Um, and then they say, okay, uh, well, great. Uh, what name would you like to be known as or go by? And then all the ballots are burned. They're completely burned. There is no, uh, they don't keep the ballots at all. So there's never any evidence of the actual voting, right? I mean, other than the fact that, you know, we know that there was a, a majority necessary to vote for somebody, we don't have specific ballot information. So, that they, and they do that intentionally. Although anybody who follows the Vatican scene knows that after there's a, a conclave, usually scuttlebutt will say, oh, you know, I, you know, people will start to reveal, oh, I voted for so-and-so. But it doesn't happen a whole lot. 
And so again, in Latin, what will happen is somebody will come out onto the, at St. Peter's, there's a balcony. Someone will come out and say, habemus papam. And then everybody will go, hey, we have a pope, okay? And then eventually, the new pope will come out and greet the people. Um, all the discussion about, do you want to be pope? What name do you want to take? All this takes place in a little room just off the side of that balcony. And it has the nickname of the Room of Tears. Uh, because oftentimes men apparently they break down just thinking about the 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 gravity of what's about to happen and the the the, the choice they're about to make in their life or that the Holy Spirit is, has made in their lives. All right, so let's move on here. So okay, we're going to talk about how do popes pick their names. So is it assigned by the Roman Curia? Uh, or B, is the Pope free to choose any name that he wants? Or C, does the College of Cardinals submit a list of options to the Pope from which he must choose his name? So, um, not surprisingly, the answer is the Pope has the freedom to choose whatever name he wants. Um, the tradition of Popes changing their names uh, once they're elected, it dates back to the year uh, 1009. There was a man named Peter de Porca who was elected Pope, but he thought it would be bad form to be known as Peter II. So he decided and said to name himself Sergius IV. Um, but even before him, though, there were some popes who decided to change their names because they had names that were of sort of pagan origin. So, for example, the first pope to change his name, uh, eventually he was known as John II in the year 533, but his given name was Mercury, which is the name of a pagan god. So, um, oftentimes, so the question is, well, why do popes pick the names they pick? Well, sometimes uh, it allows them to show respect to a, a predecessor. Um, sometimes they pick a name that's meant to sort of give a, an inkling as to what kind of leadership style or vision that the Pope has. It tends to vary from Pope to Pope. Uh, in the case of John Paul II, who's, who's listed here, he did it out of uh, respect for his predecessor, John Paul I, who again only served for 33 days. Okay, so let's get into a little bit deeper issue again. This idea of the term papal infallibility. What does papal infallibility mean? And this is kind of a big deal. Um, so does it mean A, the Pope is prevented by the Holy Spirit from ever being wrong? B, the Pope is protected by the Holy Spirit from formally teaching error? Or C, the Pope is inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach what the church needs to hear at all times? So what do we think? What, is it, what does the term papal infallibility mean? He's never wrong. He's protected by the Holy Spirit from teaching errors, or he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach whatever the church needs to hear it at all times. What do we think? Okay, so the answer is B. Okay, so, um, and we'll take a look at uh, B in just a minute, but I want to take a, a look at A for just a second here. A, the idea that the Pope is prevented by the Holy Spirit from ever being wrong about anything, that's actually called impeccability. So there are, once upon a time, there were some people who believed that the Pope had that, um, that, that Popes could never be wrong. So if the Pope said that the White Sox were going to win the World Series this year, it had to be coming true. And anybody who's followed the series in Cleveland this week knows that that's seriously in jeopardy. Okay? Um, and, you know, in fact, all Popes, we have to remember, all Popes have been sinners to varying degrees, right? They've all had their, their, they've all made their mistakes. And so none of them have ever been perfect in everything. So the idea of impeccability, it, it makes no sense because that would deny that they are human beings, quite frankly. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> you could be Pope and you could lead a pretty seriously sinful life, and some have, but you could still be protected by the Holy Spirit in terms of infallibility. Um, so. The, the, the point of the idea of papal infallibility means that whenever the Pope speaks in an official capacity about something related to faith or morals, the Holy Spirit is protecting him so that he won't be saying anything that is in error, anything that is contrary to what's already been revealed, either divinely or through uh, the magisterium. Now, letter C uh, is incorrect because uh, 
infallibility doesn't mean that the Pope is always going to be prompted by God to do or teach something. Uh, it doesn't even guarantee that when he does teach that he's going to be effective or persuasive or clear. There have been some popes who have done a poor job of trying to explain certain things. It happens. Um, so infallibility doesn't, have to do, doesn't actually have to do with how persuasive or how cogent a pope is necessarily when he speaks. It's, it talks more about the actual substance of what he's dealing with and he's protected from error in that way. So Matthew Pinto, who is a, a pretty well-known Catholic author, has written a lot of apologetics books that uh, especially aimed at teens, uh, answering questions, commonly asked questions. He, he kind of equates it to papal infallibility is, is more or less like a guardrail, right, so that the church doesn't go off the road and go down the cliff. Um, and so, you know, the Holy Spirit is something that, you know, we believe is absolutely essential in the church being able to flourish as it has for as long as it has. Um, if it were strictly up to the 